Grace and peace. How's the family doing? Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters. Grace and peace to you, believers. Life everlasting. Life glory. Life power. Life honor. Life with respect. Life in God. Life in Christ. Let's continue the conversation about the resurrection to eternal life. We're going to step in here and deal with the king's business and continue to talk about the conversation in heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ, resurrection life. For it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom is about life, joy, peace, happiness in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit with no interruption. We got to talk about life because the Father has commanded life everlasting. Let's look into his word and let's eat the doctrine and the spirit and the food of life. But before we dine, I got to give a special bless you. Thank you. Grace and peace be multiplied to the glorified, to the blessed, to the conscious, to the gracious, to the supporters, to the believers, those of you that are letting your light shine. Thank you, grace and peace, for your support, for your donations, for your help, for your love, for your obedience to the gospel of Christ. Okay, we got the bread. We got the wine. Now, as we're eating the bread and drinking the wine, be mindful you're going to have to hit the pause a few times. There's some grand, wholesome pieces and some succulent taste in here that you're going to enjoy. So take your time. There's a short clip for you to eat, enjoy, and to reckon the beauty of God that is given to you with promise and with purpose and with predestination and with blessing and with grace. Let's dime. Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, he looked at Paul and said, look at this. They follow this man, the Epicur Epicurus. They follow in the Stoics. Wait a minute. They follow in Plato. They follow in Socrates. They follow in all these people and they're devoted. They need to be devoted to eternal life. They need to be, they need to be devoted to the gospel of Christ. Paul saw their devotions and saw that their devotions was going to yield them nothing but damnation and pain and torture and corruption and abusing one another and their devotion was going to get for them the wrath of God because they were going to live in ungodliness because their devotions gave them the endorsement and gave them the yes to their own ungodliness. Their devotions were not going to convert them so he was stirred. He was not prejudiced. He was not selfish. He was not racist. He looked and said, now they need to know my king. They need to know the savior. They need to know their, their Lord. They need to be resurrected. They need to hear the voice of the son of God. Because I'm in Athens and they're walking around and they're dead. <laughs> so he preached it. Watch this now. Then certain, then he said in verse 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Because even the Jews that were in Athens, they supposed to have published the gospel of Christ. How could the city be given to idolatry and the Jews were there? To whom is committed the oracles and the gospel of the kingdom? Because God told the disciples amongst the Jews that received the word first. He said a city set upon a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle. And put it under a bushel, but put it on a table so it can give light to all. He wanted Israel, us, to be the first people. Show the people what life is all about, man. Show it to them. By you living it first. And being examples of it. Show them what life is about. So the Jews were not shining as lights in the world because the whole city was given to what? Idolatry of men. Because the Jews were in idolatry with each other. Where did the Sadducee doctrine come from? The idolatry of the Jews. Where did the Essenes come from? The idolatry of the Jews. Meaning, emulating some men that put together a doctrine and showed what he, he thinks instead of dealing with the doctrine of the facts of the word of God. So this city in Athens was given to idolatry. So, what you see in America, you see in all the world, you see where the church is, 
The reason why you see so much confusion amongst the congregation because they're dealing with idolatry instead of dealing with true worship. They're dealing with personality cults instead of dealing with true worship. They're dealing with I'm in with him and he's my friend and we close and we tight instead of dealing with the faith of the Son of God and being transformed for themselves. Because you got to see Jesus for yourself. So Paul was stirred. Because men were looking in the earth for things that you can only get from Christ in heaven. They were setting their affections on things on earth, not on things in heaven. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, showing you he gave the word to the Jews in the synagogue first. He came unto his own. And with the devout persons that in the market daily with them that met with him. Then he spoke to the Gentiles. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this Babylon say? Others some, he seemeth to be a set of forth of strange gods because he preacheth unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They said in Athens, when Paul was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, they said, you're talking about a strange God. How could that be possible And they were Jews there? Because the Jews that were in Athens were unbelievers. The Jews the Jews that were in Athens did not see that Christ was precious. The Jews that were in Athens did not understand that Christ was worthy of more glory than Moses. The Jews that were in Athens were dead. The Jews that were in Athens were asleep. The Jews that were in Athens were disoriented. But they still had a synagogue. They lost their sense of direction. So therefore the people around them did not have a sense of direction. So you brothers and sisters saying you Jews, you got to have a sense of direction. So the people around you cannot be given to idolatry because you're not in the idolatry. You have a sense of direction. You know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Because that's the doctrine that God commanded to be taught. So that's what Paul brought to Rome. Because you heard your all to be in Rome. Now he brought it to the Greeks. He's in Athens. He brought it to Philippi. He brought it to Macedon. So that God was publishing it in all the world. Why? Because as man was made, he said, let us make man. He did not just say, let us make Israel. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. But it began first with the Jews. It began first with Israel because God is faithful to the seed of Abraham. But his salvation, as he said, must be to the ends of the world. Because man must be made in the image. Because God wants man to feel the glory of how it feels to be God. To feel the strength and the power and the intelligence of the creation that's in the Father. It got to be in the children. That's why it says heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Because we're talking about the doctrine of Jesus and the resurrection. Because God is not pleased with man dying. He said he's having no more death. Because he's not stepping into this realm. God is not stepping into this realm of the earth until Christ put down all principality, all rulership, and all authority. Death got to be removed for the Father to step in because God ain't pleased with his children dying. That's why Christ had to die to put an end to death. No. They were so ignorant of the reality of the facts. They said Paul was setting forth strange gods. And some of these brothers today, they hold the Bible. They say, what are you talking about? Christ dying for your sins. Look at it. They so ignorant of Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul had to confront and dispute with the Jews because they had ignorance being propagated. Because if you're not dealing with the latest information, then you're dealing with ignorance because you're not dealing with the reality of the present truth. If you're not aware of what's going on, if you don't have the latest information, then you're ignorant. But it's here for you to learn. And when, and they took him and brought him unto Aeropagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? Because Paul was speaking a new doctrine. Because the resurrection to eternal life, it is a new doctrine. For man, to put off mortality and put on immortality is a new doctrine. And for 
sin not to have dominion over you. you you dead unto sin that's a new doctrine Paul is telling us it because he witnessed it he's not preaching something he didn't witness he was a witness when Peter said abstain from flesh she lusted war against the soul he witnessed the power of Christ when Peter saying God has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness he witnessed the divine power that was given to him he witnessed that after they escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He witnessed how to escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior. He witnessed the change of feelings in his body and his mind. He witnessed the escape. Because this Bible is written. It was spoken and written by witnesses, people that experienced it. They didn't just write this down. And it was abs it was remote to them. They, re they, they witnessed this. They experienced it. They saw it for themselves. And they wrote it down because the, the gospel was going to be for many succeeding generations. That's why it says that in the ages to come, he may show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's why they said it like that. Because God was going to let some ages come, times to go, and generations to come where man was going to hear the word and get the Bible in their generation, the word of God, and would you hear the report of the Son of God? Would you believe the record that God gave of his Son? And if you hear it and you believe it, then you live. And then you live in, you become a babe, and then you grow. But to grow, you got to deal with humbleness of mind, and you cannot grow if you take the chief seat. You do not become a babe and become a teacher overnight. That is not how it works. Don't do that. Because if you become a heretic, the heresy is the lust of the flesh. And God tell you about heresies that they that commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom. So you got to take your time. And let Christ work in you because it's given to you to be done. You don't have to be anxious or uneasy or worry or grab a whole bunch of different books. But you got to eat the word for yourself. Your heart got to turn to the Lord. And then a veil is taken away. Each and every individual. So they said about Paul, what new doctrine? Because it was a new doctrine. They didn't understand this. Because <laughs> in Christ that he spoke to them in his doctrine, because it was a new doctrine, but it's a doctrine of resurrection. It's a doctrine of eternal life. It's a doctrine of power. It's a doctrine of overcoming. That's why I said, we have overcome the world. Because like Christ said, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. You can't overcome under the old covenant, under the Mosaic law, or by the Passover. You have to overcome by standing in the gospel of the doctrine of Christ and your feet shod in it. That's how you overcome. And praying always with all prayer and perseverance in the spirit. What are you overcoming? Because they warn against your mind. You're overcoming the ungodly speeches. You're overcoming their speculation. You're overcoming their doubt. You're overcoming their utterances and their opinions. I'm not dealing with that, I believe. Abraham believed it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, let's step over here now. Amen. Luke 20. Let's go to Luke 20. Verse 38. You know, we, we were waiting for this scripture. Luke chapter 20, verse 38. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Now, can we look at this scripture? For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. So wait a minute. God is telling us, when he spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Abraham because he called Abraham to live. And Abraham agreed. He told Abraham how to live, and Abraham obeyed and commanded his house after him. When God spoke to Isaac, he told, I called, spoke to Isaac because he was speaking to Isaac to show him how to live. I mean, how to live unto eternal life. When he spoke to Jacob, when he spoke to Joseph, he was showing you God is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live unto him. So if you continue with God, if you hear the word, God has called us to live unto him. So when God said Israel broke the yoke and burst the bands, they didn't live unto him. But God is only calling us for us to live. 
and prosper and to be in health. The calling of God was never threatening, even though he said when he saw Israel in their blood, he said to what? Live. There it is again. Ezekiel 16. They were in iniquity. They made a calf. They were caught up in the Egyptian religions. But God called them out of that. Instead of them being punished with Egypt and punished for Egypt's sins, they were oppressed by Egypt, but they were still living in the religions of Egypt. That's why Aaron made the calf. But they were not punished for what they learned in Egypt. They were called out of Egypt. When they persisted in doing it after they were informed of the glory of God, that's how they were punished. But God called them to live. So brothers and sisters, in the gospel of Christ, you have to understand that God is calling you to do what? The Father's calling me to live. When he's correcting us, he's calling us to live. He said, all live, all live unto him. He told, Peter told him in Acts chapter 2, he said, deliver yourself from this untoward generation. Save yourself from this untoward generation because they don't want to live the way God told them to live. You don't want the mansions. They don't want immortality. They are satisfied with three score and ten. But after you reach 55, your strength is taken, your strength takes a decline. By the time you reach 65, it definitely took a decline. But Adam, 900 plus, but he still died. Methuselah, 969. Look at Noah. God gave man life. But remember, God dwells in eternity. So for, he, for him to call us his, his children, he's our father. Then the father got to share his life with his children. And that's what he's doing. As a father has life in himself, even so have he given to the son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to execute it because he's the son of man. So Christ is quickening the dead to give us life that's in the Father and in Christ. And the life is a life of love and righteousness and uprightness and care. And faith and beauty and walking according to the doctrine of the Father. But in Ezekiel, we have to go there. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. Verse 6, and when I passed by thee, when Israel was brought out of Egypt, it was in all iniquity. They were not right. Because when God is calling you, don't come with no pride because you ain't right. You dead. They were dead then. They were cold towards each other. That's why Moses said, why do you wrong one another? Seeing you are brethren. They were not in the brotherly love with each other in Egypt. That's why Dathan and Korah wanted to kill Moses. They were still in the degenerate, the moral decline. They were not in the beauty of the treasuring of what God is doing. In God making man, it's a beautiful thing that he gave us life. And he clothed us with skin and flesh and nail and gave us a voice and eyes and gave women beauty and curves and gave them a different voice that the voice of a woman's uh, the, the voice that comes from a woman, it, it, it's, it moves man and it's so pleasurable and comforting to men. Come on, man. This is master work. So the master came to show man the master intended resurrection, eternal life. God has had, God has had enough with death and soon death going and there ain't going to be no more death on this planet earth, period. Because death is the enemy to God. Interrupting his plans. Death is interrupting God's plans. <laughs> Death is spoiling the party. <laughs> no, because I'm gonna be in, because when Adam sinned, Adam's sin interrupted the plans that God had for him. So the sin that Adam came into interrupted God's plans. Grieved his Holy Spirit. Now everything had to go on pause. Had to be reserved. But the time going to come when God's beauty and his love is not going to be interrupted anymore. There ain't going to be no more death in the earth. Do you believe? Do you receive? You accept the righteousness and the care and the love of God because God is not subject to death. Period. 
Christ ain't subject to death, period. He, well, he came to die for us. He wasn't subject to death. So we can understand this. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 6. And when I pass by thee, I remember Ezekiel 16, 5. None I pity thee to do any of these things unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. Meaning no one looked at how you were suffering. So brothers and sisters, God knows how you're suffering, man. To, to, to be a person, to have melanin. Look at how we suffer because we got melanin. What is this? But it's God that made us and not we ourselves. So the racism that was shown towards black people on the planet earth and the racism that was shown towards the children of Israel, who we are in America, we came over here under the judgment of God for reformation to fulfill the wrath of God that we came into for disobedience. But you wasn't supposed to forward the affliction. You wasn't looking at the severity. Look at the mental decline that a holy people will come into for disobeying the spirit of God when he speaks in his son. Then they're going to take the free fall. That's why I said that the fall of them, because we fell in mind, in morals, in thought, and in action. Nobody has shown you nobody. Coming out of Egypt, none I pitied us. They don't pity us now. You're talking about a $1,200 stimulus check. Are you serious, man? Other countries, they're giving their citizens $2,000 that month. Meaning they're empowering them to be effective in the society. Not to have, live a self-existent life. They're empowering them. Now let's go back here. When I pass by here, when I pass by the Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 5, none I pity thee. God said, none of, nobody pities you. But that's fine. So can we read this in the glory of God? None I pity thee. But that's fine. To do any of these things unto thee. To have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. So one of the things you got to understand, brothers and sisters, when you cast out and nobody don't pity you, to do any of these things unto thee, to have compassion, it ain't over. <laughs> if nobody don't pity you, it ain't over. If people hate you, it ain't over. Verse 6, And when I passed by and saw thee, Polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Meaning God said, live. Meaning I'm going to help you. Live. I'm going to guide you. Live. I'm going to wash you. Live. I'm going to have compassion upon you. Live. I'm going to have pity. Live. With me. You say, live me and come to me. So it don't make no difference if somebody persecutes you, mistreats you, separates you from their company, as God told you, all the true disciples, people are going to separate you from their company. You want to know why? Because what they're doing is this. they letting sin reign in their mortal bodies. And if you reprove them, they're going to get angry. Because that's sin protesting. It's annihilation. That's sin protesting. It's mortification. So men that don't have control over their own lust and are obeying their flesh and their lust thereof. If you live a more disciplined life, they're going to rebuke you. They're going to revile you. They're going to try to condemn you. They're going to try to mistreat you because they're living in the rage of the lasciviousness. And they don't want no one around that sees what they're really doing. Which is all foolish because God sees it. We can help each other. Recover. Because this is, God said the recovering is about the recovering. It's not about remaining the same, it's about recovering. But nobody pitied them, but God said live. Because remember God said, we read in Luke 20, all live unto him. God was calling them to live. So look what he said right here. In the beauty of the, of the love of God. Now when I, verse 8, verse 8, now when I pass, by thee and looked upon him. So he didn't look at us with scorn. So how should we look at each other? God said he saw them. 
Abraham's seed. The children of the promise. Nobody wasn't pitying them. Nobody don't understand what they're suffering. When he passed by, he said, live. Because God knows people, when they pass by us, they say, die. Stay that way. Suffer. And some men in that generation, amongst the children of Israel, they wanted their own people to die. They were carrying the spirit of the oppressor. They were carrying the spirit of Satan. They were carrying the spirit of Cain. They were, since they were so full of death, that's, death would, would be the only thing that would satisfy them. But when you're full of love, when you're full of grace, the only thing that will satisfy you is love and grace. So you can know what you're full of by what satisfies you. If you're not satisfied by, by grace and reconciliation and peace and sanctification and wholeness, but if you're satisfied by envy, then you're full of envy. If you're satisfied with bitterness and strife and competition and discord, then that's what you're full of. Because man is satisfied with what he's full of. But God passed by and said, live. Because he was full of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking, that's what satisfies you. So Paul, he was exceedingly mad against the people. Because he was full of envy and hatred. That's what, and that's what satisfied him. But after he came into the gospel of Christ, he was full of kindness and love and long-suffering and holiness and discipline. And the love of Christ constrained him and controlled him. He was not wild. He was not, Paul was not soon angry anymore. Because that was out of him. He was in bowels of mercy. So what, what's in you is what's going is what's you're gonna be satisfied when you see it. If you're full of grace, you're gonna be satisfied when you see grace. If you're full of kindness, you'll be satisfied when you see kindness. If you're full of peace, you're gonna be satisfied with peace. If you see a war and fighting, you say, no, we want peace. Because that you're not gonna be satisfied until the fruit that's in you is outside too. Now, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was a time of love. So brothers and sisters, in the resurrection time that we're in, you are in the time of love. Although they made our life hard through rigor, although the environment around Israel was hard through rigor, and you got bills, but they don't give you the opportunity to, for, the, for, the, for the labor to pay the bills. Because why? Because Satan was trying to crush them and crush their hope and crush their aspiration and take them out of their cherishing because the time of promise was upon them like it's upon you now. The time of promise is upon you, brothers and sisters. We are nearing the time of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, whether you live, you're supposed to live unto Christ, like Paul said. Or whether you die, you're supposed to die unto Christ because you both have made Christ the resurrection your choice. By believing, by living, by obeying, by following. Now watch here. Thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness, showing you. They were living a shameful life, and Christ had to show them they don't live that way no more. So Paul saw them living a shameful life. He said, you can't live that no more. He was spreading his skirt over them. So that's where this misunderstanding. Paul said, I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. I mean, that's shameful. I got to put a skirt on you, man. I mean, you can't show that nakedness. You got to cover that up. You shouldn't, that shouldn't be seen. Meaning, you can't be indecent. Showing you that nakedness was a shame. You got to be covered. So when God tells about modest apparel, you cannot dispute it. You wonder why you can't dispute it? Because the father is correcting the sons and the daughters. It can't be disputed. If you're going to deal with the resurrection, if you're going to obey him instead of obeying the flesh and the lust thereof, you got to obey him. It says because the women are professing what? They're professing holiness. It tells you your daughters of Sarah, what would Sarah do? How would Sarah look? So it gives you a standard in the New Testament of a holy woman in the ancient world. Is it how would Sarah look? 
Yeah, before the fringes. Yeah, before the fringes, yeah. How would Sarah look? She was professing holiness. So God said, you are, you are, you're her daughters. She was the mother of nations as Abraham was a father of nation. She was the mother of the daughters that were quickened as Abraham is the father of the sons and daughters that were quickened. Meaning Abraham and Sarah were the parents of the quickened. That have been restored to the flourishing condition of holiness and righteousness and dignity and modesty and nobility. And what does it say right here? Let me read this part right here. And holding and manifesting the highest principles of proper conduct. Because if you're going to deal with the moral law, you have to deal with the highest principles. You have to hold and manifest the highest principles of proper conduct. Arise in knowing what is wrong in human behavior. And you are conforming to the sanctioned codes. So when it's clear and it's said that Christ redeemed us from the Mosaic Covenant, but the moral laws are in effect. The moral laws are, you're manifesting the highest principles of proper behavior and the sanctioned codes of conduct and manners and interaction and dress. You're dealing with the sanctioned codes. Because they are codes. Holiness is a discipline. You want to deal with no discipline? Profaneness. No discipline. No. So God said, Thy time was a time of love. Ezekiel 16, verse 8. And I covered and covered thy, I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. And yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with you, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then I washed thee with water, and yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. So God in Christ is washing away. He was showing you spiritually what went down. I washed away that life from you. So in Christ, that old life is washed away. The old man is washed away. Thoroughly washed away. So live the new creatures. Be divine sons with the divine nature. Be divine daughters with the divine nature. He is risen in you. He is risen, you're risen. He's quickened you. Be quickened. Live the quickened life. Because Christ travailed in order for us to be risen. He suffered greatly for our sins. Meaning for us living a disobedient life, he had to suffer very greatly. How do we show our respect for the offering, our respect for the sacrifice by the way we live our life on this earth? How we live unto him. Amen. Now, saints, grace and peace, and thank you for listening. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for sitting together, eating and dining in the doctrine of God our Father, the doctrine of resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the end of part three. There's one more part we're going to deal with, but there's a lot in this particular class that you need to sit back on and meditate and be nourished in and reckon and consider and make the right calculation. See the beauty, see the love, see the living. Grace and peace to you brothers and sisters and to your families and to your households and to your hearts and souls and minds. Be blessed. Be encouraged. Until next time, from your brother, Karadaza, Risen with Christ Ministries, grace and peace. A very special thank you to you brothers and sisters that are supporting the ministry. And we ask you to join us on Tuesdays, 7.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a conference call if you have any questions. And subscribe to the YouTube channels, Risen with Christ on YouTube Ministries and Born Again Israelite Ministries. The Lord bless you and keep you and let your light shine. Eat Christ's flesh, drink his blood, and live the glory of his majesty, walking in the divine love, walking in the freedom that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs>